there's, I mean, I hadn't thought about this very much until I started reading your work as much as I do now. And there is this thing about what is fact and what is fiction. And even when you spoke about the story that I think is supposed to be fact, it sounds like it's fiction. And is it because you're a writer that you see, in fact, fiction? Or is it that there's something, you know, when I talk about the eccentricity of the lives of your generation, is this something that's there that makes things that happen to you actually seem as if they're fiction? Tell every, I want you to talk about how your parents met and how you met Shira. I just want you to tell those two stories. I mean, those two pieces of factual history. Oh, I, I will. But, but you know, like, if you would talk about a, like strange, unbelievable stories, I think it's just enough to introduce my family because uh, my parents, no, really, because my parents are both Holocaust survivors, but I have two siblings. Like, You're not going to believe this. The eldest is my brother, uh, who had started the legalized marijuana movement that had run for parliament. Uh, and uh, he's in the anti-Zionist left. And he had left Israel with his wife 10 years ago. They moved to Thailand, where he continues his social activism from a tree house with high-speed internet. <laughs> and I told you, you won't believe this. And my sister, uh, she's an ultra-Orthodox, and just uh, two nights ago, her 13th grandchild was born, uh, uh, and uh, you know, and she, she's 52, you know, so. I was going to say, is she 50 yet? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, so yes, yeah, so, so I think, I think that the, the what I, I can say something about my childhood that I think that both my parents didn't have a normal childhood and uh, not having a, a normal childhood. Like my mother always said that the, the entire idea of parenthood was a kind of a, basically looking at your own childhood and if it was a good one, you would imitate your parents and if it was a bad one, you would do the opposite. And she said, since I got orphaned in such an early age, I have no reference, I have to improvise, you know, and, uh, and I think that both my, my mother and my father, they did all kinds of stuff that wouldn't be recommended, you know, by a <laughs> child psychologist, but somehow it worked. It's like, you know, it's, a, it's like, a, you know, you, you, the, the, the entire idea was that they loved us a lot and they did whatever seemed like a good idea. Actually, I know that you want me to tell another story, but 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 I, <laughs> you want me? Okay, I, I can tell. No, you. no, continue no, this uh, one, and then I'll remind you to tell the other one. So so a story, uh, you know, many times like when I come and I'm I'm on stage, they always ask you who's the writer who had influenced you the most, you know, and I always talk about Kafka and Bashev Singer because they were the writers who influenced me the most. But but the truth is that I always kind of have this kind of urge to cor correct the question so I can answer it differently and say who is the storyteller who had influenced it the most. And, and in a strange way, he, he, it was my father, because uh, uh, who could never make up any story, you know? He could just tell you what happened to him, and it would sound amazing when he would tell that. You know that he went to the grocery store and he bought, you know, a carton of milk, and it would, would sound like Star Wars, you know? And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and, and the thing was that my mother, since she had very vivid memories of her parents telling her bedtime stories, she had these traditions that every night they would tell us a bedtime story, like mostly my mother would, and that they would not uh, read it from books. Because when she was in the ghetto, there was no access to, to books, so her parents had to make up the stories. And for her, like reading a story from a book was like kind of ordering a pizza for dinner. It's like what a lazy parent does. You know, you buy a book and you read, like, you know. <laughs> A good parent like makes prepares a fresh story each night, you know, and, <laughs> and it was very easy for her. She has an amazing imagination, so she could make up those stories. But sometimes she couldn't tell us the story, and then she would send my dad, who couldn't make up anything, you know, and he would tell us those true stories. Like he would never introduce them as true, but w when somebody tells you a story and you see that he's not making it up, he's just like saying, "No, no, no. His name wasn't Moshe. His name was." Yeah, it was Avram. Like you see that he kind of recollects it. And 
the, all these stories were amazing, and the most powerful thing about them is that they kind of, they had something completely non-judgmental about them. Like all the characters, you loved all the characters, even though they would do horrible things and you would emphasize with them. And, and they were like, you know, they were like Hasidic tales in, in this place of, of their human love. And they all had one thing in common. They all took place in a whorehouse. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the protagonists were always uh, drunk people and prostitutes. And at the age of five, I asked my mother, uh, my father, what's a prostitute? I said, ah, well, a prostitute is somebody whose profession is uh, to listen to other people's troubles. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, so I said, wow, okay. And what's the drunk person? He said, oh, it's those people who they have these kind of physical conditions that the more liquid they drink, the happier they become. <laughs> So it was at that stage that I decided that when I grew up, I want to become a drunk male prostitute, you know? <laughs> and, and that's about Jews in the diaspora. And if you go back to what I said in the beginning about this thing, which seems to be special in this generation about Israeli Jewish creators in different disciplines, because they have the ability, the ability to be very local and very eccentric, and yet to appeal, in your case, to 37 languages around the world. And why is that the case? Well, I actually think that, that, uh, that let's say, w when you do work of art, there are like different levels in which you can zoom in to the picture. So let's say, if you read Dickens, you know, then he tells you a story of a city you know, or a neighborhood, or, you know, or if you see The Wire, you know, on TV, then it tells you, it, it kind of tells you kind of something in this kind of resolution, and you can zoom in more and more and more and more. And if you zoom in uh, and become a, a particularly specific, then at some stage you become universal. You know, if, because you don't talk about a social structure, you talk about a thought, you talk about emotion, and, and when you do that, then, Everybody can get it. The more local you become, the more universal it is absorbed. Is that yeah. what you're saying? Yeah. It's a, you know, I have a story called the, the bus driver who wanted to be God, which is a story that is very much kind of uh, inspired by the Hasidic tales I would, my sh sister would share with me because she's a breast lover, so her rabbi wrote great tales. And, and I started writing those agnostic Hasidic tales. You know, it's like... So just like Hasidic tales, but you know, I, I kind of remove God from the picture, and and uh, and uh, many times I, I would travel overseas, let's say, and I would have an event in Oslo, and after the event, like two elderly lady would come to me and say, "We gotta know, like, is this story about this driver with the mustache from the Seven Line in Oslo? You know, the one, and, and you could go to Korea, and they would talk to you about a Korean." bus driver and then you say like you know if there's something about some kind of human behavior in a certain condition it kind of it, it, people can understand it wherever you go but there is something special in this current generation of creativity from Israel that preserves the thing that is local and unique whereas in many other countries creators in different disciplines are becoming very similar. There's this homogeneity that is destroying the ability to be local at the same time that you are absorbed globally. But I think that the, the localness in Israel, it kind of, it has stronger, stronger flavors, you know. It's like, I mean, uh, I look at my son's childhood, you know, he's, uh, he's nine years old and, you know, and uh, he lives in a kind of a very kind of intellectual and Western environment, kind of, you know, uh, going to the opera and stuff. But, you know, but at the age of nine, he had already experienced two wars and knows how to deal with missile attacks. But at the same time, you know, I don't know, has cool project to write about peace and to draw little doves in his notebook, you know. I think that there's something about that that is a, uh, that is pretty unique, you know? I mean, like, maybe it's kind of a, existentially, it's a stronger difference than you can find between a, a, a French boy and an Italian boy. <laughs>